a very good morning in New York and that part of the world, afternoon or evening, uh, depending, of, your, of course, on your time zone. My name is Dominique Burgeon. I am the director of the FAO office in, uh, in Geneva, and I am really delighted uh, to welcome you to the second FAO briefing on plastics uh, used in agriculture, organized with our dear colleagues from the FAO uh, liaison office in New York as well as uh, from the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment in FAO headquarters in Rome. Uh, we, of course, warmly welcome permanent missions, uh, international organizations and others, other actors participating in person from Geneva, New York, as well as virtually from uh, all over the world. The main objective of this briefing today are one, to discuss the outcomes of the second session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee on Plastics Pollution, known also as INC2. Uh, second, to inform on the zero draft of the treaty and its implications for the agriculture sector. And third, to explore concrete solutions to address plastics use and waste in agriculture through country examples and best practices. Before starting, can uh, allow me to uh, share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this uh, hybrid discussion. Uh, this webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our websites, along with the various related resources uh, relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about uh, one hour and a half. Uh, since we, we would like to make this webinar uh, as interactive as possible, we have allocated time for a 20-minute Q&A session during which the floor will open for an open exchange. Uh, we kindly ask the persons participating virtually to write their question in the Q&A, not in the chat, including your name and organization. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, of course, colleagues in the room, uh, please uh, do it the classical way by raising your uh, your nameplate or your hand, and we'll uh, give you uh, the floor. Uh, so that's all for the housekeeping, and um, and I would like to uh, to really begin by briefly introducing our distinguished speakers uh, today. Uh, we will have quite a number of them, and we will have Mr. Jamil Ahmad, the director of intergovernmental affairs at the UN United Nations Environment Program in New York. We live sitting with the colleagues in, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, then we have sitting with me, uh, Ms. Janike Gratrud, uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of Norway to the UN here in Geneva. Uh, we have Ms. Anama uh, Solofa, uh, Lead Negotiator, Oceans Alliance of Small Island States. Uh, we have also Ms. Marinen Ila Mauti, Sustainability Leader at INPEF Brazil. Ms. Karuna Rana, co-founder of the SITS Youth Aims Hub. And Ms. Santia Anand, representative of the Children and Youth Major Group to the United Nations Environment Program. We will also hear from uh, a few FAO colleagues and uh, we'll be starting with Mr. Guanzhou Shu, uh, Director of the FAO Liaison Office uh, with the UN in uh, New York. We'll have also uh, Miss, Mr. Sorry, Lev Neretin, Environment Work Stream Lead from the FAO Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment. And Miss Alicia Kapsak, uh, Forestry Officer at the FAO UN Economic Commission uh, for Europe, UNEC, Forestry and Timber Section. Welcome you all. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. Guanzhou Shu, who delivered the opening remarks. Uh, Guanzhou, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, dear colleagues and esteemed guests, first of all, I would like to thank you for joining us here in New York. I'm pleased to be sitting next to uh, my dear colleague, uh, Ambassador, uh, Director Jamil Mahamad from the United Nations Environment Program. 
a core partner and a leader on the plastic agenda. Together with me is also from um, uh, Ms. Amana Salafi, the lead negotiator on ocean from the mission of Samoa to the United Nations in New York. I'm so grateful for the many esteemed speakers and attendees joining us in person from Geneva, as well as online from around the globe. Plastic play a crucial role in the agri-food sector with an annual consumption of 12.5 million tons used in crops, livestock production, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture. These plastic products offer many advantages, <coughs> such as increased crop yield, enhanced efficiency, and reduced food loss and waste. However, they also come with a downside when discarded in the environment, environment, the plastic generated plastic and microplastic pollution, which is progressively housing threats to food security and food safety, as well as human and environmental health. Solutions to plastic pollution in agri-food value chain needs to be cross-sectoral, inclusive, based upon principles of circularity an integral part of the overall transformation of agri-food systems to be more uh, efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. Two weeks ago, world leaders met in New York for the Sustainable Development Goals Summit and adopted a declaration which underlines the interlinked challenges we're facing and the need to address the economic, social, environmental dimensions of sustainable development in an integrated manner. A key message from the summit is that we need to produce more food for a growing population and that we need to reduce poverty and malnutrition, but that we must do so in a more sustainable way, reducing the impact on our planet the declaration speaks about a need to support global efforts to address plastic pollution and the work of intergovernmental negotiating committee to develop an international legal binding instrument on plastic pollution, including the marine environment by 2024. <clears throat> Our briefing today will therefore discuss the role of plastic used in agriculture ahead of the upcoming third meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee in Nairobi this November. So is participating as an observer to these negotiations to ensure that crucial topics of agriculture, food safety, and food security are included in the discussion surrounding the new legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. This highlights a false commitment to addressing the critical issues surrounding plastic pollution and its impact on global food systems and, and the environment. I'm looking forward to hearing more from our distinguished speakers and experts about what the UN system, UN member states, and other stakeholders, including youth, are doing to address the issue and the updates on the next steps in the intergovernmental negotiating committee process. Thank you again for joining us. We're looking forward to a productive discussion for today. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Dominique. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Guanzhou, for setting the scene and for your introductory remarks on the role of uh, the agriculture sector in addressing the issue of plastic. Thank you again. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Mr. Jamil Ahmad uh, from UNEP New York. Uh, we'll be setting the scene and discussing the role of the UN system in fighting plastic pollution more broadly. Uh, Mr. Ahmad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. A very good morning and afternoon to all of you from a sunny New York after weeks of rain. Um, I would like to thank uh, my colleague Manju and FAO for uh, hosting this briefing today 
for uh, discussing the plastic pollution issues and also the INC, and also uh, the food safety, food security aspects of the new agreement. Uh, UNEP, uh, as we all know, um, is leading the uh, the INC in a sense of hosting the Secretariat and also uh, the input from UN agencies. Our world uh, is caught in a troubling cycle of plastic production, consumption and waste. Research shows that humanity produces around 430 million metric tons of plastic annually. Without decisive action, it is forecasted that this will triple by 2040. Most of the plastics we produce go to waste. Uh, over the past seven decades, 75% of plastics produced were thrown away. Only 9% of all plastic was recycled and just 17% was incinerated. Yet the clock is ticking. July last 2023 was the hottest month ever recorded. This year is on its way to be recorded as one of the hottest years also. In, in, in Antarctica, sea ice is just has hit extreme low. The plastic crisis, or the plastic pollution crisis to be exact, is exacerbating climate change and biodiversity issues and crises as well. Microplastics are affecting many species who are ingesting these, especially in seas and oceans. Coral reefs are deteriorating. Sea deteriorating seabeds and, 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 and are transforming these ecosystems in bad way, affecting the food chains and marine life that depend on them. <clears throat> Let me give you a quick overview of the UN work. This, the report of the United Nations Environment Management Group maps the work of UN on plastic solutions, pollutions. It, it shows that the UN's multifaceted engagement is going on. The mapping detected that a total of 194 plastic-related activities are ongoing, including projects and initiatives from 23 UN entities covering as many as 167 countries. While this is not a comprehensive overview of the UN projects on pollution, it represents a significant sample. UNEP's own report, Turning Off the Tap, provides a campus for governments and an action plan for businesses to end plastic pollution by 2040. Life cycle approach is vital to ensure that efforts are focused not only just on managing waste, but also on examining how products are designed, produced, and distributed. The negotiation of the internationally legally binding instrument on plastic pollution presents an opportunity for stronger global cooperation to effectively address the plastic pollution. Two sessions of the INC have already been held and I need not go into the detail. The second session was important in the sense that it has now produced a zero draft, which will be discussed in the third INC in November in, head, in our UNEP headquarters in Nairobi. The first part of the zero draft covers the objectives of the instruments and leaves placeholders for elements that members may wish to include, but were not discussed at INC. Written submissions on elements not discussed at INC too were also invited. And the Secretariat will prepare the synthesis report of the submissions for consideration at the preparatory one-day meeting and at INC3. The synthesis report will be released this month. The second part of the text of the draft uh, zero draft discusses the elements, which are broadly structured around life cycle of plastics and plastic products with the aim of addressing plastic pollution. Consistent with paragraph 3b of the UNIA resolution, which established this uh, negotiating committee, the options in part two aim to collectively promote sustainable production and consumption of plastics through, among other things, product design and environmentally sound waste management. Part three and four outline different options of measures aimed at collectively addressing the implication 
of the instrument and part five and six are placeholders for institutional arrangements and final provisions. I want to emphasize that coordination and cooperation are recognized as key elements in the future instrument. United Nations Environment Assembly resolutions have all affirmed the urgent need to strengthen global coordination, cooperation, and governance to take immediate action toward the long-term elimination of plastic pollution in marine and other environments and to avoid the and to avoid the detriment from plastic pollution to ecosystems and human activities dependent on them. In closing, I want to stress that the responsibility to combat plastic pollution lies with all of us. It's a collective duty, and we must act swiftly and decisively to protect our planet and future generations from the impacts of plastic pollution. I thank you. Thank you, thank you indeed, uh, Mr. Ahmad, for your for your presentation, for reminding us of the the magnitude of the of the problem. And seventy five percent of the plastic produced are thrown away; only nine percent are recycled. Uh, also, highlighting the importance of uh, of uh, life cycle type of efforts, touching on the the negotiation and the, the opportunity it uh, it represents, and uh, in providing an update indeed on the on the status of the of the current draft instrument uh, being discussed and uh, and reminding us in concluding of the importance for collective decisive action i think this is what it is all about uh, so again thank you very much mr ahmad and um, i assume you will be staying there in case there are questions uh, in the in the course of the, the q a session uh, our next speaker is sitting next to me, and is Miss uh, Janik Graltrud, uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Norway uh, to the United Nations here in Geneva, uh, who will present the perspective of Norway, who is the co-chair of the I Ambition Coalition when plastic pollution on the plastics treaty. So, um, floor is yours. Thank, thank you just, very much. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so very much for inviting Norway to this important and very timely uh, briefing. Now, as some of you may know, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, Norway and Rwanda launched the High Ambition Coalition to end plastic pollution by uh, 2040 last year. And since then, many countries, including the G7 countries, have voiced their support for this deadline. But this ambition also raises some very key questions. How do we end plastic pollution by 2040? Uh, what scale of action is needed and how much will it cost? Now, these are some questions that uh, prompted the Nordic Council of Ministers to commission the report towards ending plastic pollution by 2040. The report presents two scenarios for how the plastic system could develop by 2040. The first one shows that inaction could increase virgin plastic production by two thirds nearly double annual mismanaged plastics and increase greenhouse gas emissions by 63% by 2040 relative to 2019 levels. Uh, the more ambitious scenario that the report uh, talks about uh, is with a plastic treaty with global rules through the life cycle, it could cut annual mismanaged plastic by 90%. Uh, and virgin plastic production by 30% by 2040. Now, this would take us a long way towards ending plastic pollution by 2040, but it doesn't take us all the way. So the report is also very clear that we need additional measures. Now, agricultural plastics as a critical source of mismanaged plastic pose high potential risk of dispersion and com contamination in soil. Agricultural plastics are also often burned in the open, which releases contaminants such as persistent organic pollutants into the air. Now, the report found that under the global rules scenario, recycling of agricultural plastics could increase from 1% in 2019 to 39% in 2040. So I would just encourage everyone uh, here and listening uh, to read the report 
and to further contribute with science and knowledge to, uh, to that. Now, just to add that my country, Norway, has also calls, called for sectoral programs of work to develop science-based strategies to address plastic pollution, including in agriculture. Now, these sectoral programs of work should make recommendations to the parties, such as on policies, on targets, and on other actions that is uh, suggested, identify any research and development needs, and to cooperate with the multi-stakeholder action agenda to be initiated by the treaty. So it's now 18 months since the UN Environment Assembly adopted the decision to start the plastic treaty negotiations, and we're already nine months into the work of the INC, which means we only have 15 months left. Uh, we have to advance our upcoming discussions in Nairobi and start relevant intercessional work to inform the INC to meet this deadline. Uh, that's why also I very much appreciate this initiative and I look forward to the briefing and discussions uh, and what an effective global plastic treaty could look like to end plastic pollution, including ending plastic pollution from agriculture. Thank you. Thank you indeed very much, uh, Ms. Gratrud, for, for your, your intervention and for uh, highlighting the work undertaken in the context of the High Ambition Coalition. I think uh, it would be good perhaps to, to share the, the report uh, as part of the, the resources that we will make available uh, at the end of this uh, of this meeting. Happy to do so. Yeah, I, I guess so. I knew it was a non conflictual <laughs> type of recommendation, <laughs> but uh, but we will certainly uh, circulate that so that uh, so that everybody can see it. Thank you also for highlighting the importance of science and knowledge and uh, and referring to the sub the sectoral program of work uh, that is ongoing and uh, and linking to uh, to to the point of uh, of Mr. Ahmed, uh, the saying that it's time for. Uh, to act this this uh, considering that at the end we have only, as you said, 15 months left uh, to complete the work. Again, thank you very much, and we look forward to the to the report. And uh, I would now like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Lef Neretin from the FAO Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment, who will present FAO's work at INC2. Uh, the outcomes of the negotiation and their implication on agriculture, as well as the preparation of INC3. Uh, Lev, uh, great to see you and over to you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, sincere thanks to all participants, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, and again, thank you for this inspiring, uh, welcoming remarks, uh, and also special thanks uh, to FAO liaison officers in uh, Geneva, New York, for organizing this important event. As uh, I think I just, oh, my apology. I, I think it's, Yes, my apology for, I think uh, you can see now the second slide. Uh, over the last 70 years, uh, the use of plastics in agri-food systems uh, has become pervasive, low cost and adaptable. Uh, plastic products are now present in almost every part of our food systems, uh, from fishing gear to tree guards to greenhouses. Uh, while they increase the productivity and efficiency in all agricultural sectors, and help uh, minimize food loss and waste, uh, also increase uh, productivity. At the same time, they're also a major source of pollution, primarily environmental pollution, and only now we're recognizing increasing risks uh, to food safety. Their long-term use and lack of systematic collection, as we just heard uh, during welcoming remarks, uh, leads to plastic accumulation in soils, and aquatic environments, humans and ecosystems. In 2021, FAO published a global assessment report which called for action on plastics in agriculture, 
which identified that uh, over 12 million metric tons of plastics are used annually in various agricultural subsectors. And just for comparison, this number is almost the same number of the plastics which enter the ocean on an annual basis. The majority of 80% of uh, plastic products are used in crops and livestock production, but also important to mention uh, fisheries and aquaculture, and the least of uh, plastics is used in forestry sector. Uh, in our report, we analyzed different uh, plastic products, uh, and I think especially this slide uh, shows mostly uh, situation with plastic products in the terrestrial agriculture. And we avoid uh, able to identify uh, specific plastic products which require priority attention and assign a certain risk categories. And especially I would like to mention that uh, to this categories belong uh, polymer coated uh, fertilizers, mulching films, which is the major category of plastics used almost in all regions worldwide pesticide containers, uh, and so on. Uh, potential alternatives and interventions exist in many instances, not in all, but to better balance the benefits and trade-offs of plastics. And for this reason, our report and continuous, uh, the, the messaging we're bringing to, to various fora from FAO is the importance of using 6i approach from refusal which means minimizing use of plastics up to least preferred uh, option recover than all other alternatives uh, have been exhausted. I would like to mention, for example, in agriculture, there are very diverse uh, ways of managing plastics. For example, instead of using uh, plastic mulch in some applications, but not in all, uh, we can use cover crops to replace those mulching films. Uh, for example, we can use biodegradable um, uh, products instead of plastic ones, for, uh, for example, for uh, seedling pots. Also, I would like to mention we're here today during this meeting, the importance of extended producer responsibility, mandatory voluntary schemes, uh, which are very important for collection and recycling on non-biodegradable uh, plastic products, particularly uh, pesticide containers. Uh, I think also today we will uh, pay attention to fisheries and aquaculture sector, which uh, receive a special attention in the zero draft of the plastic treaty, um, where um, plastic materials which are being used in the sector could be hazardous or problematic, especially when they get lost, abandoned, or discarded at sea. And for that reason, we are using a particular terminology, abandoned loss on otherwise discarded fishing gear, uh, which causes significant impacts, uh, not only in the marine environment, but very important on the marine biodiversity with over 600 species of marine life impacted, and obviously with important consequences uh, for food security, livelihoods, safety, and uh, environmental pollution. For this reason, uh, FAO Council is uh, one of our major governing bodies. In December last year, uh, took into account uh, conclusions and observations in, in the report uh, we presented and made the decision which consists in three major parts. Uh, the first one, um, FAO has been encouraged by our membership to continue undertaking further scientific assessments to fill important uh, knowledge gaps related to distribution and various other aspects of uh, plastic use in agriculture. Um, the council also underscored the importance of multi-stakeholder cooperation, again, very prominently uh, uh, reflected in the intergovernmental uh, negotiating committee um, and discussions of the plastic treaty. And important, uh, we receive a mandate uh, to develop a voluntary code of conduct on the sustainable use of plastics in agriculture. And finally, uh, membership encouraged FAO to support um, intergovernmental negotiating committee um, negotiations uh, on uh, plastic treaty.
uh, we are currently in um, in the middle of uh, in the development of voluntary code of conduct and here I just present the timeline uh, we have completed uh, we briefed uh, our members in rome um, mid this year we conducted global expert meeting we already conducted three regional consultations in Asia Pacific in uh, Northern America and um, uh, and, uh, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And we will continue uh, uh, conducting those multi-stakeholder consultation until the end of the year. Uh, we also, uh, in order to increase um, participation of various stakeholders in, in the process developing voluntary code of conduct, we currently have online consultations uh, posted on the Food Security and Nutrition Forum. And I'm asking my colleagues to share the link uh, in Q&A uh, that, uh, and we really encourage you, please share it with your constituencies. Uh, we are looking very much for your inputs. The uh, draft we're expecting to deliver um, to our governing bodies until the end of the year. And as you could see, this goes uh, almost in parallel in a complementary way with the ongoing negotiations and ongoing discussions in the uh, INC. Uh, we have uh, the FAO delegation actively participated, provided inputs during the first uh, meetings, and we're also planning to be in Nairobi in November uh, this year to support our membership um, at the third session. We participate as an observer, um, supporting our members and advocating for the treaty that recognizes the critical role of agri-food systems in sustainable management of plastics and as an important sector to uh, uh, as an important sector to end plastic pollution um, to the environment. If I, uh, our position did not change much since uh, we joined uh, these negotiations, and I think these four major points for us remain uh, critical and important. Uh, first, um, as already mentioned, uh, we are bringing to the negotiations the importance of balancing benefits and trade-offs in sustainable use of plastics in the sector. This is probably one of the most diverse and complex economic uh, activity sectors involving uh, providing important livelihoods and uh, food security and nutrition to the global population. Therefore, the, this particular aspect is very important. And also, uh, obviously, to reflect on the perspectives of those uh, different stakeholders along agri-food value chains, especially smallholder farmers. Uh, similarly to the uh, overall overarching framework, um, as again, we heard in the welcoming remarks, uh, we advocate for the holistic circular and evidence-based approach, uh, which is equally applied to agri-food systems, um, uh, to plastic management and agriculture. Uh, we believe the specificity of plastic use in this particular sector may require um, approaching them in the context of sectoral approach in the future uh, treaty. And we are um, continuing um, discussing this issue with, uh, with the membership. And finally, um, we emphasize the importance of uh, referring to the existing FAO guidelines and uh, normative instruments which have been developed, particularly in the in the marine domain, in the fisheries and aquaculture sector, especially uh, voluntary guidelines on marking um, fishing gear that should complement existing provisions um, under the instrument. I'm almost uh, to the finish. We are still uh, carefully analyzing the zero draft, uh, but I believe so this uh, five major points um, we are very uh, pleased uh, to see many uh, many inputs and many perspectives which we have been bringing to these negotiations reflected in the in the zero draft, especially very strong uh, messages on sector specific approaches which come in different articles, draft articles of of the future treaty. 
Uh, we emphasize the importance and recognition of the complementarity and coordination with existing um, instruments. Uh, for example, uh, we noticed that uh, abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear is specifically reflected in the waste management uh, articles and includes agriculture-related provisions for problematic and avoidable plastic products, uh, as well as intentionally released microplastics. Um, agricultural sector is mentioned uh, as a sector with respect to specific circularity criteria and also guidance to be developed. Finally, I would like to mention that while um, the uh, primary plastic polymers and chemicals and polymers of concern are outside of FAO mandate, uh, we see very strong messages coming in the, in the zero draft, which certainly will be beneficial um, for agricultural sector and especially if uh, adopted, many of these provisions uh, will result in the reduced inputs of those harmful chemicals and um, plastic polymers where agriculture is a user um, of those materials. And I think with that, uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. I look, we are looking forward uh, to your questions and uh, productive discussion. Thank you. Over Thank, to you. You. Thank you very much, uh, Lev, for your presentation, which I will not attempt to summarize because I'm told we are we are running a little bit behind. But thank you also for highlighting still the, the, the work FAO is doing, mandated by our governing bodies, including the, the the voluntary code of conduct on sustainable use of plastics in agriculture, certainly very important. And for reminding us also that FAO is actually participating as an observer in the INC uh, negotiations and uh, and is there basically to support our members. So I think it's important to, to know that and for the delegations of the countries participating here to be aware that they can count on, uh, on FAO support, of course, when it comes to uh, discussions related to our areas of mandate. But uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, Lev. And uh, just to mention to the speakers that there are a number of questions that are already coming up in the, the Q&A, so you may want to, to start uh, responding to that. And I would now like to, to invite our colleague Alicia from the FAO UNEC Forestry and Timber section to present the role of bioeconomy and circular economy uh, to address plastic pollution. Alicia, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dominic, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'm really also happy to be part of this uh, important discussion. And I will talk about the role of bioeconomy and circular economy to address plastic pollution in agriculture. And uh, you will see that in my presentation, I will reiterate some of the information that was already mentioned by colleagues from UNEP and from Norway, and also from colleagues from VAO. Uh, I also want to mention that I work for the UNEC and VAO forestry and timber section. And in our work, we cover data monitoring and assessment, policy and dialogue and advice, communication and outreach and capacity building. And as you can see, the plastics are uh, present everywhere and agriculture is not an exception. Uh, you can see plastics in obvious applications and in some they're not so obvious as mentioned by Lev also in fertilizers that stay in the soil and then become microplastics. So uh, we have in front of us a big problem. In 2019, agriculture value chains used more than 12 million of tons of plastic products in plant and animal production, and also over 37 million tons in food packaging. And as said before, only a fraction has been collected and recycled. Most are buried today on landfill. And we talk a lot about the pollution in the oceans, but it's important to know that soils contain larger quantities of microplastics than oceans. That leads to erosion, reduced water infiltration, and decreased microbial activity, resulting in negative impacts on ecosystems and biodiversity. In particular, these single-use plastics have impacts which threaten soil condition and water quality. 
degrading into microplastics, they can accumulate in food chains and threaten food security, food safety, and ultimately also human health. So it's a problem that uh, we are all responsible for. Uh, Bioeconomy and circular economy can provide solutions uh, in the form of bio-based materials, which offer promising alternatives to the decrease or elimination of use of plastics. And that's also mentioned by Lev, the mulching films are a persistent problem. And also seedling trays and pots, tree guards. Uh, it's a few examples when they can be replaced by uh, bio-based solutions. And also on the photos, you can see how mulching uh, films uh, behave. At the beginning, you can see how, how the plantation looks like, how they degrade in the, uh, on the ground and also the amount of pollution they create. In circular economy, we're also talking about the circular use of diff different containers, plastic containers, also big bags that contain plastic, and also about increased collection and recycling. In urban environments, this uh, problem or uh, of uh, collection of uh, plastics and sorting and recycling is much more, it has much more attention, but in agriculture, we are still uh, having the problem, as mentioned at the very beginning in the presentation by colleague from UNEP, that this problem is not tackled in agriculture enough. Also, nature-based solutions provide um, alternative to the use of plastics in agriculture, and uh, an example also can be cover crops and plant residues. Uh, in uh, as an alternative to these mulching films. Uh, besides the same functions as mulching films, they can, in addition, uh, create the benefits of absorbing rain and retaining soil moisture. They also increase soil health from microbial activity. They retain soil from erosion and suppress weed growth and provide habitat for pollinators. They also sequester carbon. Bioplastics uh, are based on plants, algae, fungi, and bacteria, and they are also alternative in situations where we cannot use, uh, when you can, we cannot eliminate plastics. They are fully or partially made from biodegradable and biological resources, are less toxic, and have a lower environmental and carbon footprint. And uh, they can be used in situations where plastics cannot be avoided or cannot be replaced with reusable or more durable materials or cannot be easily retrieved. Then we can use the biosystems. And examples of these alternatives uh, include uh, um, bamboo, coconut shells, paper, but also cardboard, biomass, and many, many others. Innovation is really uh, growing. It is happening in the private sector. It's also uh, one element that needs to be connected to these uh, negotiations, maybe. We are not talking only about the problem, but also what could be the solution. Mm -hmm. And as the demand for agricultural plastics continues to grow, promoting circular bioeconomy approaches is essential to reduce plastic waste uh, through, through prevention, as also let mentioned, reduction, reuse, and recycling. And I can only highlight these approaches. Also tackling agricultural plastics pollution in, uh, through a circular uh, bioeconomy is a vital measure in helping to deliver the objectives of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And it's also uh, embedded in the FAO strategic framework and uh, in particular, the program priority on bioeconomy for sustainable food and agriculture, which is closely linked to SDG 12, which includes responsible consumption and production, but also waste disposal is an integrated yeah. element. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, uh, Alicia, for clearly highlighting how bioeconomy and circular economy can help uh, to identify alternatives to plastic and sharing solutions to address uh, plastic pollution in agriculture. So, again, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ms. Uh, Anama Solofa, uh, who will be uh, speaking on the Friends of Action Agenda, uh, launched by Samoa, in the US at INC2. Uh, Ms. Solofa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good afternoon or good morning. Um, it's um, great to be here. And this morning, you have two of us from the permanent mission of Samoa. Um, <coughs> 
With me is my colleague, Bryce Rudick, who is the legal advisor um, with, with the mission, um, based at the mission at the moment. And we're here to speak about, as you mentioned, the uh, Friends of the Action Agenda, or Friends of the Plastic Pollution and Action Agenda, um, to provide a quick update. Um, I'll just, in the interest of time, I'll just give a quick background and Bryce will speak more to some of the um, sectoral work um, that is uh, outlined uh, through, um, in the action agenda uh, intentions. So Samoa in the United States um, initiated the Friends of the Action Agenda um, to have informal discussions um, on potential approaches for enhanced stakeholder engagement in connection with the negotiation and uh, future implementation of the um, Plastic Pollution uh, Treaty, which is currently being negotiated. Um, in line with the mandate set out at uh, uh, UNEA 5 um, under resolution uh, 514. So the meeting of the action, uh, Friends of the Action Agenda took place in Paris uh, during INC2. Um, and this was followed up um, recently, a little over a week ago, uh, here in New York, by a second meeting of the Friends of the Action Agenda. And during this, uh, the meeting, there a number of questions posed to uh, stakeholders who attended the meeting um, to provide an update on what was happening, um, what key actions were happening um, in the different sectors and what actions they're taking to combat plastic pollution, um, what role or and what the role of such actions would be in the global goal of ending plastic pollutions and how <clears throat> actions can be incentivized through future international, um, the future international instruments um, action agenda. At the end of the meet um, two weeks ago, a call to action was then um, made to those who were in attendance, uh, calling uh, on multi on stakeholders to enhance efforts to achieve the global goal towards any plastic pollution by 2040, um, uh, looking to um, organize them, uh, themselves into relevant sectors, providing or preparing stakeholder action report. Um, developing sectoral plastic pollution reduction pathways um, toward in, uh, ending plastic pollution by 2040 and contributing to the and to contribute to the INC process. Um, and Bryce will speak a little bit more to that. Thank you. So um, in creating the Friends of the Action Agenda, uh, Samoa in the United States, we're um, really focused on two objectives. So first is increasing ambition in the negotiation of the instrument itself. Um, we know uh, that this is a problem that will require uh, really um, all sectors to be involved. Um, and if they can demonstrate through this process that action is happening um, and greater action can happen, uh, then we feel that we can actually negotiate a more ambitious agreement. Second, um, that we need to enhance near-term action. Uh, there is already, as we have heard, uh, tremendous amounts of plastic that is flowing um, into the environment and then into the marine environment. Um, and we cannot wait for an agreement to be negotiated and implemented before we start to take action. Um, so enhancing ambition in the negotiation and then enhancing action um, in the near term. In order to do this, we think that we really need to focus um, at the sectoral level. Um, these are the actors that best know how to reduce plastic use, plastic production and use and waste in their own sectors. Um, and so as Anima said, um, we are focused at the sectoral level um, and focused on a whole number of sectors. We actually have 13, um, uh, packaging, fishing, municipalities, health, construction, petrochemicals, tourism, agriculture, fashion, a whole number of sectors. Um, and really, uh, in the near term, we need them to do two things. First, um, produce what we're calling a stakeholder action report, uh, which tells us about the action that is already happening in the sector. If we know what's happening, we can then build on that. Um, and then second, uh, to uh, create pathways. We have set a goal of zero plastic pollution by 2040. Um, and we now need sectoral pathways to tell us how we get from where we are now to where we need to be in 2040. Um, and we think this is best done by the sectors themselves. Again, they know how to make this transition. And we think it is critically important in these pathways to have interim targets. If we just set one target in 2040 of zero plastic pollution, 
uh, we won't know until we're very far along whether we're meeting that. So interim targets in 2030 and 2035. Um, we will have an event um, on the Saturday or Sunday before INC3 that will bring together um, a number of these sectors. And of course, um, FAO and the agriculture sector uh, will be invited and hopefully be there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very much indeed, Ms. Solofa, for sharing the perspective of uh, of Samoa in the context of the, the French of uh, the friends of action, and uh, indeed Mr. Bryce Hudik, I think is your name, uh, for also providing additional information, including on the importance of uh, enhancing ambition and enhancing action. Uh, also the the. And, and for the comment also on the event that you organized before INC3, would be good also if we could add that to the, the material that we will be sharing with participants so that uh, people are indeed well aware. So thank you very much for that. And uh, our next speaker is Miss Milene uh, Ilamauti, who will be uh, presenting the case study of INPEF, a Brazilian organization responsible for uh, managing the collection and disposal of pesticides container. Uh, Ms. Ilamonti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this time to share the experience in Brazil. Can all you see the slides or? Yeah, no, it is. Yes, very well. Yeah. Uh, what is the Campo Limpo, what we call the Campo Limpo system, is the reverse, the Brazilian reverse logistics program for all empty packages for crop protection, using crop protection, and also the ones who are left over. So the ones that are the grower did not use all the, the products, we also receive and recycle. And INPAV, the entity that I represent, is responsible for managing all the system. So the system is actually a multi-stakeholder. We have companies who are um, uh, registered in importance uh, or the ones who put the packaging in the field. And also all the entities from growers association, farmers, distribution dealers, and all different sectors from the government also. Uh, how that works, I think we, we, we like a lot to say the four uh, uh, foundations uh, are uh, based on our success. So the legal basis, we have a strong law, an enforcement and understanding that everybody has your own responsibility in this uh, system. The integration, it is a collective as I, I listened several times during the explanations and collaborative system where everybody has your own responsibility. Education, we, we, we put a lot of um, resources in education and awareness, and also we have a look at the process and technology. So everybody, all the chain, all the value chain in agriculture is present. So from the farmers, from the industry, from the public power, and also the distribution channels, how that work. So the manufacturer is actually the one who produce and put the packages into the environment, goes to a distribution channel, the farmers will use, and he has, the farmer is the most important uh, uh, element in this system because he is responsible to triple rinse and take the packages to a receiving station. Also, we have uh, collections around the, the, the country. As you know, Brazil is a, is a big country and we have a several different uh, farmers from big farmers to small farmers. So they all included in this system. And also, or in the end, is what do we do with this plastic? So we can say that 100% of all the plastic is recyclable. So even though it's uh, having um, anything from uh, plastic, flexible, uh, big bags, everything is recycled. And the highlight of the system is the circular economy. So the collected um, drums and, 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 and packaging are produce new packages. How we do that? 
using different partners, okay, around the country. And also the parts that we cannot recycle will be going to incineration. I also listened to several of my co previous colleagues, a panelists saying the in, in, in the beginning, people will be buried or burning the, the containers. And also that was the case in Brazil 20 years ago. So today we don't have that anymore. We don't have this condition anymore. Everything goes to a recycled plants. Okay, and becomes a new plus a new container or a new cap. Okay. Also important to mention it is, you know, from the numbers it was presented before, is it still not that big, but we have contributed to designate 700,000 tons of empty packages. Okay, this is a lot of packages in the last 20 years. The most important contribution, it was what we avoided in terms of a CO2. So it's almost a million tons of CO2 that was avoided, or it, it was not emitted to the environment. And also the amount of energy that we uh, were able to avoid or to use because of the recycle plants and, and the recycle use of the containers. I mentioned before, one of our foundation is education. So we are very uh, happy to say that we have uh, this program for 12 years. It already impacts over 2.3 million students around Brazil. And it is uh, for kids from 10 and 11 years old. And we've been recognized in the past for the UN as a uh, program that uh, disseminated the sustainable development goals, mainly the goal number four and 12. Uh, we would like to invite you all to come to Brazil and, and see all this case that we are presenting here very briefly. We also have put everything in the museum where is an educational center for people who experience the circular economy. Okay, and also I want to thank you for the time and attention and invite you to visit us in, in our uh, media, social media and site. I do have a um, film, a video to show if I still have the time, not sure. Go you ahead. How long, long does it last? It is three minutes. Okay. okay so let's um, go for the Mm -hmm. Can you please uh, show your film because we can't see? You cannot listen. No, we can't see anything. Mm. Oh, it seems you will. Have you I'll share have, again. If, yeah, probably share again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the material, and we will for sure uh, share it with participants. But thank you very much, I think, for this uh, presentation of the, the case study in Brazil and being concrete. Because I think what is nice in this presentation is that we have seen the, the magnitude of the problem, efforts that are being made uh, at, the, at the negotiation level in the context of INC. Uh, the INC process, and then we have a very concrete example of uh, of something that is being done. And I like the, the what you have been uh, uh, presenting in terms of the avoided emission and uh, and that sort of thing. I find it very very telling. So thank you very much, uh, Miss Ilamonti, uh, for that. And next we will hear from Miss Karuna Rana, uh, who is the co-founder of the Seeds Youth Aims Hub will be talking about life cycle approaches to tackling plastic pollution, including nature-based solutions, and why this is especially important for uh, six small island developing states. Uh, Ms. Rana, the floor is yours. Thank you, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share um, a bit about the uh, Mauritius context, which is a big ocean state. 
And um, I hope to bring in um, an on the ground perspective of what I have been seeing and working with. Uh, now, before I delve into why life cycle approach is important, I think it's important to give a quick background um, about Mauritius. As I mentioned, Mauritius is a big ocean state and like other big ocean states, um, fisheries and aquaculture are important um, in terms of our food systems. But very often we just tend to focus on that and on the marine pollution side of things and less on what's happening within terrestrial agriculture. And I think the FAO speaker before me put it up, uh, put it put out some very um, concrete um, evidence and data about how there may be a lot more uh, microplastics in the soil than in the ocean. Um, now, when it comes to Mauritius, I wanted to talk a bit more about that side of things, which is to do with uh, microplastics in the soil and uh, what can be done to what are we doing, but also what more can be done to tackle. Um, uh, plastics um, within agriculture. So this is particularly important for small island developing states or big ocean states, as we like to call it, because a lot of um, the big ocean states are majorly reliant on food imports. Right now, um, uh, to uh, only 30% of our food is, is coming from inland. 70% is imported, but as we are aiming to increase food production on land and thus uh, food security, we will be having more agricultural systems put in place. And this is why it's particularly important for small island states to think about um, the sustainability of it. So just to um, give some data, Mauritius has only one, sanit one sanitary landfill, again, very similar to the other big ocean states. Um, so almost all the waste is sent to the landfill um, and um, especially plastic waste because recycling is not really big on the island. And um, I wanted to now touch upon a 2021 study that was done um, on microplastics in agricultural soil, wastewater effluents and wastewater sludge. And um, all of we a heavy amount of microplastics was found in all three places, and more than fifty percent of the microplastics that was identified was polypropylene, followed by polyethylene and polyamide. This is for agricultural soil, and um, this actually indicated that most of the plastics are coming from the likes of plastic nets, packaging, and bags used in agriculture, and a lot of it could be intentional or unintentional by farmers. Um, a high amount of, actually a higher amount of um, uh, microplastics was found in wastewater effluent and sewage sludge, keeping in mind that in Mauritius over 10% of treated um, effluent is used for irrigation and the rest is dis discharged in underground water, surface water and the ocean. Um, sewage sludge, all of it is sent to a landfill. So as you can see, um, eventually they will find a way to enter a food system um, affecting obviously the ecosystem, but also human health. So these results clearly indicate we need better alternatives to plastic use in Mauritius, especially the agricultural sector, because right now that's not on the radar. And um, as such, um, the work that we have been doing has been focused on three things. So firstly, we have been partnering with um, an agricultural startup called Everbloom, whereby they do um, they train small scale uh, local farmers on sustainable agricultural practices. But um, this has not included um, the use of plastics, because as I mentioned, that is not really on the radar of small of small scale local farmers um, who continue to use plastic in, in um, the way it is traditionally used. And um, uh, they're not aware of the impacts of it. So we are um, including that in the training that we give them to do with sustainable agricultural practices. Um, which brings me to the second point, which is alternatives. Obviously, we need better alternatives. And again, um, the FAO speaker previously mentioned about biomaterials and uh, nature-based solutions. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, you know, and this is a work I had done for plastic straws. Unfortunately, right now, there is not much... Um, uh, standard or equal labeling available for the different alternatives that exist to plastic in Mauritius especially. So for example, I had done a study on plastic straws that uh, showed that a lot of the alternatives, um, for example, PLA or uh, some of it that was sugarcane based were not entirely biodegradable and could have um, similar impact, could stay in the environment for as long as plastic. On the other hand, um, um, 
uh, there were materials that had a higher carbon footprint um, than plastics themselves, sometimes three times higher, and thus requiring even more energy to produce. So as you can see, um, you know, we don't want to contribute to um, climate change by while trying to solve one problem. So it's very important for us. I mean, obviously there will be trade-offs, but it's very important at least to set up um, some kind of standard um, and um, certification in place to ensure that we are not moving forward with false solutions. And um, this also is linked to a high cost of uh, certifications that could come with it, especially for um, innovators and small companies that may be producing these alternatives. Um, thirdly, when it comes to nature-based solutions, um, seaweed could be, could be um, you know, very big for small island developing states as it comes from the ocean. And there are so many examples of seaweed being a um, very good um, alternative to plastic as a nature-based solution. Um, but again, um, as I mentioned, you know, this is not really in the radar. A lot of the innovators and startups working on nature-based solution and alternative to plastics are focusing on consumer products. They're focusing on the likes of straws and the likes of cutlery um, bags, but not much is being focused on what is being used in agriculture. So I think we also need to look into what incentives we could provide to these um, uh, startups and innovators for them also to look into produ uh, products that could be used in the agricultural sector sector and cost will be one of the barriers. So um, yeah, so that's a bit about uh, the perspective from Mauritius and the work we're doing and i um, happy to talk more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rana, for indeed sharing your perspective from uh, Mauritius and uh, highlighting the, the situation and the, and the issue faced by, by the small island developing states uh, beyond that, referring also particular the issue of uh, microplastic uh, and the, the, the alternative that exists in it. So thank you very much uh, for that. And it is now uh, my pleasure to, to turn to uh, Miss uh, Santia Anand, who is a representative of the children and youth major group uh, to the United Nations Environment Program uh, to discuss the issues of the issue of plastics used in agriculture in India and the important role uh, the youth has to play in the in meeting uh, the, the INC. So, Ms. Anand, uh, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, I'm currently based in Sri Lanka, so the, we, the Asia Pacific Environmental Authorities and the Ministerial Forum is happening. So. Uh, and plastics has been one of the main agendas uh, in this forum. And so I guess this is a connected space to be also talking about it. Um, on the context, on the context of uh, Indian scenario and in the aggregation of plastics, one of the uh, breakthroughs or sort of the entry points that we see right now is that there is a national mission on sustainable agriculture that is pretty new, that is trying to come in, um, which is also looking at uh, soil fertility and the health of the soil, which is also, again, connecting back to what's uh, uh, happening with microplastics in the soil um, and the agricultural plastic that is being used. So that that's sort of the one point I see is a coming uh, process of um, what we could see in the next five years or 10 years to sort of develop into something. The other is in the context of the EPR regulations that have also come into play, which uh, is as of 2021 effective, although they do not uh, uh, directly address agricultural plastics, they are broader in terms of addressing plastics from all sectors. Um, that is all coming into play, which uh, uh, currently as of now, the implementation has not started in full term. It is being implemented in, in uh, sort of a, year by year base and uh, we have around eight years to go for 80% um, of plastic recycling that is being manufactured uh, or being imported into the country as well. Um, so that's the context of uh, what's happening in addressing agriculture plastics in India. Um, there's also the uh, issues uh, with, let's say one of the examples is, uh, I could go on more in detail is in the context of uh, plastic mulching which is also increasingly seeing uh, an increase in trends of usage that is also being there. And it's also connected with the fact that um, one of the 
missions that the government is sort of trying is to doubling farmers' income, and so one of uh, and so the uh, the plastic monitoring has been merged into that as well. But uh, what's also happening on ground is, uh, for example, in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is one of the divisions that come under India, is uh, plastic mulching is actually subsidized. So farmers can actually go uh, uh, get subsidized uh, pla uh, plastic mulches. So, that, so on one side, there is the sustainable machine on agriculture that's trying to sort of remove all of this. There's also other side, which is also counterproductively working. So I guess that's that's sort of the scenario in context of agricultural plastics. I'll quickly move to the uh, youth in the context of uh, INC. So um, like I was just mentioning, the Asia Pacific Environmental Authorities Forum is happening and we just had a youth forum before this. Um, and uh, in one of the sessions, we had this wonderful group of young people who were working on uh, uh, basically if uh, this was the 2021, we had a, a, a nurdle uh, spill disaster in the coast of Sri Lanka. And this was the group of young people who had come together, thousands of young people who came together and started manually designing the sieves and started silting their coastline. And they've been doing it for two years now and successfully so. Um, so this is sort of what young people are also doing on ground. Um, and this is the perspective we are taking back to the negotiations. Uh, so uh, that that's sort of, I guess, one of the motivating factors of how we're doing it. And how we're doing it is in this context, uh, we have established the Global Youth Coalition on Plastic Pollution, which brings in more than six youth constituencies, including the constituency that works uh, on UNEP processes. We also have um, the constituency that is working on uh, chemicals and waste. We have the Global Youth Health Caucus um, and then the caucus that's working on sustainable communities and then the one that also works on sustainable consumption and production. So it, it is a coalition that has brought in six other youth constituencies that are working on other various other UN processes and trying to bring all of those perspectives into the negotiations and the youth perspectives as well. Um, majorly, I guess the focus has been one of the focus uh, of the uh, coalition has been trying to bring the human rights perspective, which uh, what the first draft uh, acknowledges, uh, the zero draft acknowledges the human rights perspective as well. This is also something that we have been trying to bring, especially in the context of um, children, uh, a, a, in the context of, let's say, Waste uh, collection is also intrinsically linked with, um, we have waste picking communities that also involve children. So that's one perspective, I guess, uh, we've, we've been trying to uh, uh, advocate for. The other uh, is also in the context of, again, um, in the human rights perspective as well, we are also trying to um, advocate uh, uh, for how waste collection is also connected to um, the waste pickers coming from a specific class, which again ends up uh, uh, putting uh, young people who are coming up in 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 in, in countries uh, at a disadvantage position when they're growing up. It, it also connects back to their health, right to health, and so on. So uh, that's a, a little bit overview for what's happening and what's motivating us and what we're doing. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Miss Anand, for uh, indeed uh, reminding us of the importance of involving youth voices. Uh, thank you. you. You covered many things, but also for referring to the Global Youth Coalition on Plastic Pollution, which you are uh, fully engaged in. I think this is uh, indeed very important and for indeed mainstreaming youth in uh, important processes such as uh, such as the INC. This provides me to make a parenthesis to say that the week of 16 October in Rome, we will have the World Food Forum and within the World Food Forum, there is the Youth Forum, which is really uh, recognizing the, the important youth has to play in the context of agri-food system transformation. 
So thank you very much. Uh, we are running a bit short of time, but we have, a, uh, and there has been a rich dialogue taking place in the, um, in the Q&A module. But there is one perhaps that I would like to address to Miss Anama, uh, which uh, reads as follow. It's very simple. How can we get involved in the friends of the action agenda? And it is coming from Kelly Sheridan of the US Dairy uh, Exports Council. Ms. Anama, do you want to take that one? Thank you. Um, thank you. And we're uh, quite happy to share information with um, um, through the documents and presentation that will be um, circulated in, a, uh, in relation to this, um, to this briefing. Um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's the best way I think that we can get the word out there uh, for those interested to join the friends. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we look forward also to information on the event you will be organizing uh, before INC3. Uh, well, I think this brings us to, to the end of today's uh, conversation. Uh, thank you very much for uh, a very fruitful uh, discussion. I hope that this event today offered a platform and space for our members and other stakeholders to share information on ongoing work and learn about other good practices on how to manage plastics in agriculture. Uh, I think we had uh, clear messages from our experts within the sector about the importance that plastic products currently play in food security, but also their potential for harm if mismanaged. Uh, we have also heard that the sustainable management of plastic products and their waste on farms pose particular and complex problems that require sector-specific solutions. We hope that these messages will prove helpful uh, to the discussion at the next discussion of uh, at the next session of INC INC three, and uh, and a bit of uh, advertisement you now uh, to say that for your environment agenda, we'd like to take the opportunity to to uh, to inform you that of the some of the upcoming activities, including the celebration of the World Food Day on 16 uh, October. Uh, to celebrate this important UN day in Geneva, we'll be organizing an event on that day in collaboration with the FAO Plant Production and Protection Division on agroecology and water. I know it can indeed address the, the urgent issues related to water management. Rome will have its flagship uh, World Food Day event. And in New York, there will be a joint event with the New York Botanical Garden, uh, organized by our colleagues in uh, in the liaison office in New York. In celebration of the World Food Forum uh, flagship week uh, from uh, 16 to 20 October in Rome, uh, our liaison office in Geneva will be hosting a youth uh, photo contest at the Palais des Nations, uh, which uh, with a launch of a photo exhibition on the 16th of October. For those based in Geneva, of course, uh, we hope you will be able, able to visit the Palais to see the inspiration photos submitted by youth, which align with the theme of the World Food Day this year and, uh, and World Food Forum, Agri-Food Systems Transformation Accelerates Climate Action. Uh, with that, thank you again to all. We look forward to uh, continuing this discussion. Uh, there will be a number of other INCs so I guess there will be other opportunity to, to update you and to, and to keep creating this, uh, this momentum on the importance of uh, urgent and decisive action. With that, thank you very much. Big thank also to my colleagues in, uh, in New York, in Geneva, for, uh, for working with us on this uh, event. Bye-bye. Have a good day in New York. You just start. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> Excellent moderation and your advertisement for our World Food Day in New York uh, with the Botanical Garden. Have a nice uh, evening. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.